I can only think of a couple, like maybe a small handful of American knife makers who make knives that are worth a crap. And they're charging an exorbitant amount for a knife that is of lower quality. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to episode number 124 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn everything about knives and knife collecting and knife sharpening. Hint, hint, wink, wink. And hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, or viewers, anyone who loves knives. And Bob, I, I gave a little hint there on the intro, knife sharpening. Yeah. That's what our guest is all about today. That was pretty slick, Jim. Yeah, uh, he is. <laughs> I was pretty proud of myself. <laughs> He's one of these guys that I admire greatly because uh, he is known for his very, very special edges, and he does everything by hand on on stone-like surfaces. In other words, uh, not uh, not consistent angle sharpening, uh, but uh, doing it all by hand. He's learned from experts, and uh, he now well, he, and he is an expert. And people pay extra money when they're buying a, a custom ferrum forge knife to get his edge put on it, and. Uh, if anyone knows Mike Emler, you, you know him on social media. He's very active there, and he's he's a funny guy. You just you just know he's got a great sense of humor from looking at his posts. But anyway, um, his sharpening is is crazy. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting something done by him. Well, uh, we've got Mike Emler, the Emler Edge, <laughs> as you may have uh, heard of him, coming up on our interview show coming up next. But first, I do want to remind you about the Knife Junkies YouTube channel. You can find all of his uh, knife reviews, unboxings, links to Thursday Night Knives, uh, special knife town halls, all that kind of good stuff at the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube. That's the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Again, Mike Emler, our guest today. Let's get into that interview now. You know you're a knife junkie if you answer to the nickname Blade. I'm here with Mike Emler. He is a super knife sharpener and also the designer of the Wee Stonefish. Mike, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. You're you're also known for um, making a lot of videos about knives and and kind of opinionated videos. And and actually, I was watching one this morning that hurt my feelings. And uh, it was funny because I was like. You can watch this, Bob. It was your one about Emerson's because I am a, I'm an unapologetic oh. fan of Emerson knives. And, and I was watching it and I was like, everything he says, I, I cannot disagree with, but still. Uh, and, same thing with Benchmade and Spyderco. I get a lot of hate because I, the thing with Benchmade and Spyderco, I've said it in my videos. It's, it's not coming from a place that I hate those companies. It's coming from a place that they used to be the top tier. Right. Like when I was young in the military, Benchmade, that's what everybody carried because they were amazing and they've just let quality slip and not change the pricing structure. With the uh, Emersons, Emersons is more that like, I think they could try a little harder. <laughs> all right. All right. I, okay. Before we get to any of that, I also, I also want to set this all up by saying you're the man that Ferrum Forge goes to, uh, when they want, when someone requests a, an extra special edge and Emler edge. Yes. And, uh, so, Let's start there, and then we'll work. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll get into some background stuff. But I, I want to okay. know how this happened. You know, uh, they're they're an acclaimed knife company, and yeah. you're you're well, a, so, a knife nut. So what happened? How'd this happen? So before my daughter became a teenager and wanted to have nothing to do with me, and skating took over her entire life, um, she and I used to watch knife making videos, Walter Sorrels, and and some of the other knife making things, and and uh, like Green Beetle. And because she shared an interest, it, it was something that we both enjoyed watching with someone making knives. And and I have always been in a knife, grew up on a farm and always needed a knife as a tool. And one day we were looking at videos and she saw a Farm Forge video and recognized some of the places up near where, the, uh, with my wife being Japanese, we'd go to a, a specific area where there's a lot of Asian markets. And she recognized, she's like, that's, you know, that's the store that we go to. And I was like, yeah, you're right. And we found out they were in San Diego. And so I reached out to Chris and Elliot over just a DM. I was like, my daughter would like to have a shop tour. Do you guys have a problem with that on like some Saturday? Maybe we come up. 
And so she was really excited. We went up and they opened the door for us. They took my daughter around the shop. They put like boxes and stuff so she could see what they were doing. They showed her how they make knives and stuff like that. And I struck up a friendship with Elliot. Elliot and I are really, real similar personalities. Being in the military and being an athlete are real similar to the way you interact. And so Elliot had played semi-pro hockey in Canada for years. And so we struck it off real quick and just struck up a friendship. And I started going up and then we started doing a thing. They had a happy hour on Fridays and we just hang out. It was like a knife show. We'd all just kind of joke and play. And then I told Elliot I wanted to make a knife. And he taught me how to make knives. And from there, then they realized that I do a lot of knife sharpening. And they, it was something that I said they could offer. He's like, you know what? We should offer that as an add-on, just as a little, you know, a little cherry on top for our customers. They're already paying like almost 600 at the time. It was like around 600 bucks for a knife. So why not add that in that if they want it as a showpiece? So it started out that their maker's choice knives, the ones that they do over the top elaborate, all came with my edge. And then Chris and Elliot paid me per knife and they just added it onto the price of the knife. And so we figured out a pricing structure where I made money and then they made money on that item as well. And Elliot's actually one that coined the phrase, the Emler edge. Hmm. And yeah, so it just, kinda, it just kind of went from there. And uh, Elliot has allowed me to use the shop to make knives. I've made like a hundred, over a hundred custom knives in the shop now at this point um, and, and sold them and pre-ordered stuff. And basically now the sharpening is how I pay my shop rent. I don't make any money on a knife that Farron Forge gets sharpened. Uh, that basically just stays with them. And that's how I pay my shop rent. And then the only thing I have to worry about price is belts and my own materials mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So that's how that all came about. And it just was a Friday night of us just hanging out in the shop, drinking beer. And it was towards the end of the night when we were all like sitting around waiting until we could drive. And Elliot's like, you know what? We ought to just have you start sharpening some of our knives. He's like, I hate sharpening knives. So tell me about your sharpening. What's special about it? How did you learn? And you know, tell me about your history in sharpening. So I grew up on a farm and we never had, you know, you never had a chance to just, you take your knife, you go back to, at the time it was like a four or 500 acre farm. So if you're out in the middle of the farm, you need a sharp knife, you always carried a small stone. And so I learned to sharpen by hand on, on relatively small, like slip stones, um, like maybe three inches long, an inch wide. And so I had a, you know, I had a kind of a technique to that where I could keep edges up and then. You know, my dad, we had to sharpen for butchering and stuff on the farm because we had cattle and deer season and butchered pigs. So you had to have a sharp knife for that. Well, then as as time progressed, I joined the military and I started sharpening knives for guys on the ship. And I had really gotten into I had taken martial arts since I was a little kid and I had gotten into watching uh, the Japanese. I had started taking Japanese swordsmanship and I really got into how the swords were made. And about that time was when YouTube had just kind of started not really so much youtube but there were like you could find videos online of like how swords were made and then it's not the making but then the polishing the big full convex that a japanese samurai sword had and so uh, about like 2003 ish i had just come back from iraq and i was like i was watching a video about how they polish swords and i was like there's got to be a way to do that and emulate that movement that they use rocking the blade on the stone to emulate that and get that really acute edge at the very front, but then have material behind that's almost like a like a wedge that pushes material out of the way, which is the way a samurai sword works. And so I started practicing on some on some small stones or whatever stones I could find. And I started just doing this rocking movement of the stone in the palm of my hand and the knife itself. And so what you get is a complete convex that you cannot do on a fixtured system. And so a lot of times that edge will last longer because you have a very, very fine, acute, thin edge at the very apex. And then instead of having like a compound edge like they do on a when you when you first buy a Sabenza, it has two distinct angles. I basically roll that all the way back. And what you have is a really acute edge with a lot of material behind it to hold it with no friction points, like a really steep shoulder where those angles meet. And so it just it seemed to work out. And I found that the edges held better than a lot of the other things. You know, I tried fixtured systems and I never really liked them. And pull throughs just really damage a knife horribly. Oh yeah. So that's basically I just I took a technique that I'd seen someone using to polish a Japanese sword and, and turned it into something that it wasn't supposed to be. And I ruined a lot of knives getting <laughs> that trying to get that that right, you know, that that rocking movement. But now it's at a point where I've sharpened so many knives that way 
I can't do it any other way. Like I, I have a real hard time if I bench the stone and I try to do just like a straight, I, I really have a hard time with it. And I'm at a point now where like, if I watch it too much, I lose, I lose my apex. I have to kind of like watch a movie or something and, and kind of look away and focus on something else and just let my hands and ears do the, do the work. You know, so two, it's, not, it's time to flip it. Two questions though. So, so you have the stone in one hand and the knife in the other. Mm-hmm. Is that what you're saying? And it's, yeah. and it's that kind of a, a rocking motion where they're both coming together. And then I'm sorry, the second question I want to make sure I don't forget because I forget. Okay. That, is each one of your, each Emler edge is a, is a convex? Yes. And less specifically requested, I will bench the stones and try and give it a V grind. Mm-hmm. Um, I really don't like the idea of a micro bevel. Um, some people will put a, I, I'm, I'm never, when I sharpen, it's never for aesthetics. I have a lot of people that want a super polished edge, but a lot of times I, it winds up being polished just because of the stropping that I do, but you still have an aggressive edge with something like that. And then as far as the rocking movement, so if your stone is flat, I kick the the stone up and down like this. Say this is the flat part of the stone, up and down, but I also do the same with the blade. And so you wind up with each pass, you wind up with multiple angles and when you first start on the core stone, you can see each individual line that's a little shoulder, but you can't ever get those angles exactly right. So on each pass, there's like three smaller angles as it passes through because I do a push-pull. I do a pull stroke and then a stropping stroke to maximize the amount of effort. You know, I'm already doing that stroke. Why not just take it back? And it takes me half the time than just a dragging stroke or only a stropping stroke. So when you get all those angles put together and then you, as you go through the stones and you progress, you knock all those shoulders off and you wind up with just one consistent radius. So it's, it's a really good edge. In, in, uh, some of the best outdoor knives, like, um, Park River knives I've had, uh, they have that convex edge and it is mm-hmm. so robust and at the same time is so sharp, so sharp. Yep. Uh, maybe it's because it's in a way zero ground, just not V zero ground. It's sort of U zero yeah, it, ground. Exactly. Kind of, kind of like that. And then the, the other thing too is, uh, I don't like in the stropping step, I always use, so I do use chromium oxide to knock the initial burr off, but the final stropping is done on diamonds. Everybody's like, Oh, well, when you get to that high grit, there's no bite. There's no tooth. You know, I can take a next 12,000 grit and still have it be toothy. And people mm-hmm. like that. No, it's burnished. It won't cut. Uh, Jim Skelton said the same thing. If I, I did a video with him at a knife show. And you can see the immediate look on his face when he grabbed the knife that I handed him. It was 12,000 grit. He was like, okay, I might be wrong. <laughs> because the, the what happens is a lot of people will strop things and their stropping compound breaks down. And then you burnish your edge. But if you're using diamond, diamond never breaks down really. You just kind of, it kind of just goes away and you just have to replenish it. And so those tiny, tiny micro serrations that are on that blade are still being cut even all the way up to basically 30,000 grit. Uh, when I take it all the way down to a half micron. And so there still is a, a real bite and a tooth to it. But that, you know, that's just customers that want that. Most of my knives, I don't take above about 2,000 grit. So you're saying in regular compound, non-diamond compound, the, the tiny little abrasive um, bits will eventually get pulverized even further to the point where yeah. where they're making smaller and smaller bites and the edge becomes beautifully polished, but also so uniform that it's almost hard for it to bite into something without horsing it, and pushing into it. If you look at them, if you look at the serrations, when you sharpen a knife, you're just basically turning it into a super, super fine saw blade. Hmm. And if you look at that under a microscope, you see that the serrations are like this. But what happens when your compound breaks down is they just round over. So instead of being sharp and, and, and lined up like this, they just kind of round over because there's no sharp points on your abrasive anymore. If you use chromium oxide, you can get away with it. You just have to make sure that like, Every third time that you strop, you just got to put your compound on. Right. So you recently, uh, I guess it was last year, 2019, uh, had your custom knife, the Stonefish, uh, released in production version mm-hmm. through we, we Knives. Um, we're all familiar with We Knives and their yeah. extreme quality. Uh, but we're talking about this edge. And now before we even talk about the rest of the knife, did they uh, reproduce your edge? No, their, their edge is just a, a belt edge, which, uh, they, we knife company does, we knife company is one of those companies that when I get a knife, I very rarely immediately sharpen it. I, I let that factory edge stay. As a matter of fact, of the prototypes 
and production samples I have, only one of them I've sharpened. The rest of them still have the factory edges because they do a really good job with their edges. And they, because they use a clean brand new belt for sharpening and they keep it at a low speed. They're not overheating the edge, things like that. Uh, but no, there's no real way unless you use a slack belt to sharpen like Bark River Knives does mm-hmm. that you're going to get a convex mm-hmm. edge. Uh, it's just, it's too much. There's too much. I mean, basically, if you're going to do it at that, you would have to have a dedicated grinder just for that, that you would slack belt. And uh, so we talked about that. They were asking about the edge. And I was like, you guys, edges are great. Uh, If people want them sharpened in a different way, a lot of people sharpen their own knives. If you get my edge, it's going to be more difficult to sharpen if you don't, if you have a fixtured system. So I was like, let's let's just leave it as a V grind. And if people want a convex edge, they can either do it themselves or they can send it to me. I have made convex grinds. Uh, I had. Uh, we can talk later about about some knife brands and and your um, <clears throat> very honest and sometimes scathing uh, takes on them. But but always like uh, from the heart. Uh, I had a very obtusely sharpened uh, Emerson, and I uh, ended up chisel convexing it, and t- kind of turned it into one of the sharpest knives I had. So it was. It had the the chisel benefit and the convex benefit, and I just did it by putting um, progressively smaller grit, finer grit sandpaper on a strop and just kind uh-huh. of stropping it. And uh, I, I have to say, it totally uh, reinvigorated my love for that knife, which I ended up selling. But still, th- doing that really kind of resuscitated it. Yes. I mean, and there's there's ways of doing it. I've seen people say that they've, they've taken sandpaper and put it on a mouse pad. And use that cushion. And you can do it. Um, I just find that I don't like the edge that you get on sandpaper. Hmm. I mean, Elliot's knives are great. They come really sharp. They're probably the sharpest knives out of the box that you're going to get. But they're not a production knife. Um, and Elliot uses sandpaper on a on a two by two inch wood block that he puts in a vise. And he stands there. And I'm, I'm 6'3", and Elliot is a giant. <laughs> and so everything in that shop is built perfect for like for me so that sharpening setup he's got puts it just about the same level that i use for when i hold a stone in my in my uh, hand and so i've sharpened some knives on that but i just never like the feel that you get from the sandpaper the edge is different uh and it's because of the breakdown of the abrasive it doesn't form a slurry like a you keep having to move your, your sandpaper but yeah there's there's a lot of ways to do that and uh and I, I I need to revisit the video about the Emersons. I, I do, <laughs> because I have seen a marked change in the quality in the last couple of years since I first shot that video. So uh, It looked like in that video you were holding a pretty old um, commander. And uh, they, for a long time, used this weird double detent system that they have since gotten rid of. I actually now, I, you know, I have uh, I have nine Emersons. <laughs> and and a number of them, uh, most of them are that older double detent. And I've really, once you break them in, they're 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 like horses, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you about livestock. But w- once you once you break them in, they are smooth and 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 lovely. We're not going to talk about Emerson right now. I, I do want to talk about the stonefish though, and tell me okay. about the design of it. I, I look at that, and part of me wants to grab it and do collie with it and the other part of me thinks it looks like a great outdoors blade but i'm not much of an outdoorsman so tell me what well, went into making that kind of was that was kind of the, the thought i had you know i was in the military i spent i went down right i went to after iraq kuwait and afghanistan and they would always issue you these big bulky like a cold steel srk or a k-bar and those are great knives don't get me wrong but like i would look at it and i was like guys it's not 1940 anymore it's not the age of trench warfare why do I have this one trick pony knife that then I have to carry other items to do minor tasks because you can't do small detail work with a K bar. There is no way. And I, all those years I was like, there's gotta be a way to have something that's combat capable, but also is a good field knife or utility knife. And I came up with the idea. I want to make a, a combat utility knife. And so the first thing I did was coming from a martial arts background is I wanted the handle to have multiple hold points. And so I made the handle first and then designed a blade to go with it. And so it it was based on, you know, do I want reverse grip? Some people might. Do I want to be able to reach further back and have a a palm swell so I can go back a finger? 
a finger cut out and, and have more room for a snap cut. But do I also want to have multiple hand positions forward where I can get in and do detail work where you can get up on the spine and hold it and use just the tip or get up in that forward choil for some heavy duty cutting? Because like, like we all know, you can't do much with a combat knife in the campsite. And that's where you're going to do most of the work. That's so that's the, where it came from. It was just something I always wanted, and they never had it. And I was like, I will just design my own knife. When I look at the stonefish, that's exactly what I think. I mean, I, I see the it, – it's got an aggressive kind of forward look. It, it, it's ready for a thrust for sure, but it's got mm-hmm. a almost fully flat ground blade or maybe fully flat ground. It's a flat grind, but I did make sure that we left a flat spot oh. on the spine for people that do use a fixture system where they would need to clamp it. And and then it's got the forward choil, so you know you can get up and do detailed work. But also, like you said, and I'm a big fan of the giant cold steel knives that have a different, uh, you know, million different ways to hold the handle. And when I look, you know, that's one of the filters uh, that I interpret a design through. And looking at the stonefish, that's one of the things I thought of. And then the third thing is it looks great for reverse grip because of the slant of that handle. And then you got all that jimping in there. And uh, yeah, it, it's... Uh, it's a cool knife, man. <laughs> I told I told Mick Strider that I had to credit him for the uh, the reverse jimping on this on the handle down at the butt for reverse mm-hmm. grip, the Microtech DOC that he helped design. With, I told Anthony Marfione the same thing. That directly came from the fact of how comfortable the DOC, the Microtech DOC, is in a reverse grip, and it's because it's got that broad angled area with some jimping where you can get it in a good reverse grip. And I was like, I directly stole that from you guys i'm sorry <laughs> and they both were like no that's that's great we we well, i'm glad you love it so there was a lot of things that 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 knife took like design cues from other knives like the multiple grip handles definitely is that's a cold steel thing the reverse grip the thumb ramp jumping on this on the butt from microtech and marfion's doc the blade shape is very, very similar to my favorite production knife i own the best production knife i've ever bought which is the react horizon d um, that blade shape is very similar uh, because it's a really good blade. I just wanted the, the the spine to drop down to a more aggressive tip. So it was more in line, for, just like you said, for thrusting. But very, very similar in blade shape because it's an incredibly good blade shape. And so like, I told all those people this. I was like, like no one can say that they don't know that I did directly was like, I took design cues from all the knives that I love and just incorporated them into something. Better that than taking all the design cues from one knife you love, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, exactly. That is the whole point of of refining designs. I mean, we're 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 looking at uh, you know tens and tens and tens of thousands of years of knives, and we're mm-hmm. still refining them, changing them, tweaking them, making them to our our liking. And uh, you know, so to me, like it's just amazing that you had an opportunity to actually tell the people that inspired those various those various things. Uh, so I, I want to ask you another question about the sharpening. We mm-hmm. hear so much these days, and and you are a prolific YouTuber, um, and uh, uh, especially recently, as we yeah, are all especially I'm on, I'm on disability because my doctor won't let me work. <laughs> uh, but the uh, the behind the edge measure, it's something you hear a lot from from uh, reviewers. Mm-hmm. Tell me how important you think that is. I mean, it's a, it's a double edged sword, and I, I'll show you right now one of the most aggressively ground knives that I've had come in in a very long time, and it's this Nick Chirpin NCC, uh, super super hollow ground Mark One. And while this knife is slicey slicey slice, it's almost non existent behind the edge. Well, that knife is not going to hold up to the, what I would put a knife through. So for me, the behind the edge thickness is going to be a knife to knife thing. And people are like, Oh, you just can't make a decision. I was like, well, if I've got a knife that I want to beat through a piece of oak, I want it to be thicker behind the edge. If I want something that I'm going to use in an office setting where I'm going to sharpen a pencil or, or a shop setting where I'm going to sharpen a pencil, where I'm going to be cutting paper and cutting things out of boxes, then I'm probably going to want something that's thinner behind the edge. So I'm kind of conflicted. It, it just, it goes from knife to knife. Um, I do like, knives that are thinner behind the edge for a folding knife or pocket knife that's going to be more of just a day-to-day carry thing but something that i'm going to carry for a like a hard use i like to have a little bit more thickness behind the edge because there's less chance i'm going to crack that edge or crack that blade if i happen to put some torsion on it 
so I would say the Sabenza would be a good example of that. Nice and thin, good hollow, but it's got almost a double hollow where there's a spot right behind the edge where there's a little bit of thickness where you can feel it when you run your finger up. And so you get the boat, the best of both. You get that super thin profile for slicing, but you've got a robust tip and edge that's not going to crack. And one that you can sharpen presumably over a long period of time and be able to get over that hump and then exactly. still continue on and have that razor blade. Uh, exactly. like I, 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 uh, I recently got the Civivi shredder and, uh, I also got, uh, the, the, um, the gent, uh, what's that? The rustic gent in the pass around group. And these are two of the, the most thinly ground hollow, uh, th- well, they're, they're already thin blade stock and then they are super thinly ground. It's like yeah. the air runs in fear as, <laughs> as you, I mean, it is, these are so thin and something about them. The rustic gent, I like it. On the shredder, it almost feels too thin. I feel like I would break it. That's exactly what I was saying. Like that, I love that Turpin Mark One, and I I hate the fact I have to send it back to my buddy Nico (laughs) because it's his knife. I love having it; it's great action and everything. But it's it's just one of those things that, like, no, I would not take that to do a lot of the stuff that I normally would do with a knife. It's just not going to work out for me. So, what are your favorite steels? Um, I have a lot of steels that I really like. Um, the top two are 20 CB, which like you can say 20 CB M390 204P. I love them because they're really versatile. They hold an edge really well. And they're not, for me, they're not that difficult to sharpen. Like I could sharpen them in the field. For a lot of people, it might not be the case, especially if you get one of my customs that's like 64 Rockwell on 20 CB. It's a nightmare. But the fact is like, I love that. And then I like, RWL 34. I love RWL 34. For the same reason like S90EV, they're kind of a tie. They take a super crispy edge, super, super fine, terrifying edge relatively easily mm-hmm. on, on budget stones. They polish up really nice, even at a lower grit, and they hold an edge for as easy as they are to sharpen. They hold an edge really, really well for the ease of, for comparatively ease of sharpening. And then you have that flip. You would think that, that the wear resistance at holding an edge would prevent you from sharpening like S30B is a nightmare to sharpen. I was but presi- it's the exact opposite. S30B, it, I don't find holds an edge very well. It's a nightmare to sharpen, but then it doesn't hold it well. The S90V and RWL34 exact opposite. Easy to sharpen and hold an edge relatively well for a long time. Those are I, my two favorites. I always assumed that S30, that S90V would be three times the pain in the butt to sharpen than S30V. It, and people say that. And when you look at the spec sheet, it should be. But from experience of having sharpened, not to sound pretentious or conceited, I sharpened more knives probably in the last two years than most people own in a lifetime. <laughs> and I find that S90V is relatively easy to sharpen compared to what it should be on the spec sheet, it does not have that much issues with being sharpened. And even on aluminum oxide stones, as compared to like diamond stones. You mentioned RWL uh, as being your second, well, M390 slash 204P slash 20CV, and then RWL 34? RWL 34. Uh, It's what the Grimsmo brothers use in the Norsemen. Thank you. That's what I was going for. What what knives can we find that? And it's... So the Rasp, the Norseman, there's other people that make it. And anything you get in Damasteel, Damasteel makes RWL34. So RWL34 is the shiny component that's in Damasteel. And so Damasteel would have to be up there too, but it's so pricey that like I can't say it's my favorite because I can't own anything. And it really, uh, but I mean, basically the car, the the two components in it, in uh, Damasteel are basically the same steel but one has a little bit higher carbon content to allow you to etch it so you wind up with a homogenous all of it's the same steel basically at the same hardness and you don't have the issues that you have with like alabama damascus but rwl 34 is it's it's it gets insanely like frighteningly fine crispy edge to where you can like push you can just touch it and watch it split the skin on your thumb you're like that's <laughs> going to leave a mark so when you get a knife or, or I guess you don't get many knives these days, as you said, but when you're evaluating a knife or reviewing a knife, what, what are your criteria? What are you looking for? And what to you is high quality and, and what to you is worth it? So for me, 
I have, and this is why some people, I'm, I'm a very, I'm a very, very diversive person. I can cause a lot of hate and discontent because having grown up in the background I did, working on a farm and growing up around livestock and things like that, I don't look at a knife as, as a tool or as a toy. I mean, like a fidget toy. And this is where my friend, uh, Ashton and I differ. Um, I'm not a knife fidgeter. Like I know that you probably had a lot of people on the podcast and all you hear is click, 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 click in the background. I'm not really that guy. I don't fidget with my knives. I look at a knife just like I would if I was going to buy a tool. One, does it do the job I want? Two, is it comfortable? Because if I'm going to use it a lot, I don't want a comfort level that is questionable. And so there's a lot of knives out there that come in and I can look at them and say, yeah, this is a gorgeous knife. But is it a knife for me? No. The pocket clip has got a hot spot things like that. I don't like deep carry pocket clips because they, mm -hmm. I've got really big hands in the way a deep carry pocket clip sits. It causes a hot spot and palm my hand. And I don't like it. But I was like, oh, deep carry pocket clips are the best. I'm like, well, that's great. Not on this channel. So the things I look for in a knife are, does it do the job I need? Is it something I can carry easily? Can I, if I'm carrying it as a defensive tool, can I deploy it properly? Which was my big problem with karambits for a long time until I got the Wii incisor as a gift. And then like, can I use it and have it be comfortable? And there's a lot of times that that winds up putting you in a cheaper price range. I had so many custom knives, Bobby, I had so many. And then I got the Microtech EOC and realized that I was like, this is a $300 knife instead of a $1,200 knife. And it's better. This is better. And that's kind of what changed it. And I, I did a flip flop on looking at custom, because I had custom knives I paid a lot for that were not near as nice. And so things that, just little little design cues, like if you've got a milled pocket clip, does it come down on the backside to an angle where it's not a sharp corner, like a lot of like a lot of milled pocket clips are, where they just come up square? I hate that. And for me, a pocket clip can be a showstopper. Every once in a while, there's a knife that kind of just flips the script on me, and I have no reason no reason to like it. And okay. I have this knife, and but you know, what, what do you describe what you're holding up, and and why I'm, shouldn't you like it? So this is my this is my uh, Ultramar Street, the the Chavez Ultramar Street. So it is basically a smaller version of the two two eight, and uh, it's got a really it's really thick, it's really blocky, lots of sharp hot spots. But there is something about the aesthetics of this knife that I'm like, you know what? Is this is this my typical knife? No. Does it have? Should it just be? All my alarms should be going, don't, you don't need that. But aesthetically, it is gorgeous. And that's the only reason it's here. So, I mean, the majority of the time, it is a, just a functionality based decision on a knife. And that's what causes problems with people. Oh, yeah, but like they did this and they used these ceramic bearings. And I was like, I, I don't care if they use, you know, I don't care if they use little round rocks. I still don't <laughs> like the knife. I don't care if they found a way to use like shot from a shotgun to make it roll. I don't care about the the fidgetability and playability of a knife at all, except for my out the fronts. I have a couple out the fronts that are just there for fun. Oh yeah, yeah. You you got to have a few of those. So really, you're saying um, it is all about the tool itself, how it works, and, yes. and, and how it functions. And and so this brings me to something that is a, a hot topic just right now, especially uh, with all the closed down economies around the world and such. There's been a lot of push in the knife world. You've been hearing a lot about now's the time to buy American no matter what. And, and, uh, it, it is, uh, something that, uh, you know, I, I buy a lot of American knives and I love them, but I also love all knives. I have a number of Italian knives, a number mm -hmm. of Chinese knives, and then I have a whole lot of cold steels made in Taiwan. Yeah. And, and, and then, and then this issue grows like, well, what about an American company that produces some here and some there like where do you draw the line and so i'm going to ask you how you feel about buying american right now because it's american well i i did my entire i spent my entire adult life in the military and, and working for the government until just here just a few years ago so i'm all about buy american but the problem is and i'm gonna this is gonna irritate a lot of people i can only think of a couple like maybe a small handful of American knife makers who make knives that are worth a crap. And they're charging 
an exorbitant amount for a knife that is of lower quality. And everybody's like, oh, well, you're supporting Chinese government, things like this. And I would argue that, okay, so let's look at it this way. I had the stonefish made in China by We Knife Company. I made money off of that. Yes, did We Knife Company make money off that? Yes, did the Chinese government make money off this? Yes. However, people aren't buying that knife directly from We. That's not a closed loop commerce. That Those knives went to American distributors and vendors and then supported the U.S. economy by supporting those businesses, small mom and pops, and supporting me, a small American business. So I don't see it as that single-sided. And the flip side of that, too, is I would argue that people aren't saying buy American. People are saying don't buy Chinese. And I really have a problem with that. Quality should not. I don't give a, I don't give a crap where you make stuff. If you make a quality product, that should be recognized. And the fact is, until American manufacturers pull their heads out, China's going to eat their lunch every day of the week because everybody's like, oh, well, you know, it costs so much more to make stuff here in America. And I would argue, why? Why does it cost so much more for us to make stuff here? I do understand minimum wage and things like that. But the fact is, we are a resource-rich country. And we could, we could mine our own iron ore and kick back up steel production in the United States, make our own stuff here. If people were willing to make a little sacrifice, take pay cut. I wanted to start a business. I had a job working for the government where I made six figures. I make currently about $35,000 a year. You know what? I'm happier. I made a sacrifice for something I wanted. And that's something that has been forgotten in most of business until you get down to the small mom and pop entrepreneurial style businesses where they're like, well, I guess I'll just work seven days a week, 12 hours a day. That level of sacrifice that we experienced after World War II that made us the greatest nation in the world has been lost because we were so wealthy and overabundant with everything that we forgot what actually got us there was sacrifice. And no one wants to sacrifice. Oh, I want people are, are, are wanting to come into a company and get a job where they start at $25 an hour. And we're raising the minimum wage. And the fact is that workers that have been there for 10 and 15 years, new employees are getting a pay raise automatically coming in the door. These guys started they might only be making $17 an hour and this guy starts at 15. He had to work for years to get the $17, $18 an hour. How fair is that to him? There is no sense of sacrifice in this country anymore. And that's something that you hear a lot from my fellow military brethren is like, why, why did we do this? Why did I sacrifice if no one else is willing to? What, this is garbage. And, and that's something that we need to bring back. Self-sacrifice in the name of the country as opposed to only think about the bottom dollar. Mm -hmm. I, I like the model of, I like the OEM model and I feel like it is scalable and translatable over here. And we could be making designs by people such as yourself here in this country with the say, with coming out with the same level of quality that say we, we knife and OEM makes over there. They're not strictly an OEM. But, uh, you know, we no. have we have some fledgling uh, efforts like that here here in the States. And and uh, uh, I think I think that there could be a market for that. And, man, I hope that I hope that happens. I, I really would like to see more manufacturing here. But, man, I, I cannot deny how fine my, uh, you know, my Riyadh Crossroads is. You can't I, like I told Dave Deng every time I see him in a knife show, I was like, Dave, still the best knife I own. Like as far as production knives, my Riat Horizon D is still the best production knife I have ever owned, hands down. So what do you what do you identify as the problems with? Um, and, and we don't need to name names, but you were saying you know there are a lot of uh you know U.S. companies used to stand for the the, the highest of quality, and now yeah. now you see some of that slip. What are the kind of things you see slipping? It's just general quality control stuff, like just actually giving a crap. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll say it like I'm, I'm not going to mention Emerson too much because Emerson's kind of a different animal. Uh, they are meant to be a little rustic, but like I think you pay too much for for that kind of rustic uh, finish. Uh, but knives like Benchmade and and Spyderco, I used to I used to love 
spider toe. As a matter of fact, I get two spider toes in my case. I love the Endura model, but I can't recommend those companies to anyone anymore because they used to be high quality. And they just they, they just basically got to a point where they're like, oh, we, we don't give a crap about the we've got enough of a fan following that we can sell these knives no matter what the quality is. Law enforcement still loves Benchmade. I mean, at least at least the uh, the random smattering of police officers I know through work and such. They still yeah. love their Benchmades kind of unconditionally. Yeah. Now, they're, well, there, there are a lot of other options out there, sir. <laughs> no. uh, and the other thing is just like trying companies that just try to just make so much money right up front. On, on the back of someone. Uh, so prime example, I wanted the stonefish. I definitely wanted the stonefish to be an American design. I wanted that to be in the hands of military members. But with the Buy American Act and the fact that every U.S. producer that I approached wanted to chart, I already had a proven design. I had a full CAD file that was basically plug and go, but wanted to charge me like between two and four thousand dollars for prototyping and i was like i already did prototyping i made these knives by hand i got them in the hands of seals so that they could test them and and stuff like that i have some friends that are seals and i let them take the prototypes and um you know and i was like okay it's a viable design they love it and when i approached um so i'm not going to mention any names but i approached some american companies that do do oem and it was just it was like oh you, we have you have to give us this much money so that we can render your designs and everything. i already have a render like it's a plug and play. Elliot Williamson took my designs and we sat there and we went through it and made sure thicknesses were there and everything was set and how I wanted everything socketed. There is really very little of anything that needs to be done, except maybe you make a couple prototypes and I give you the thumbs up and then you can sell them. I'm trying to license this design and, and no one wanted to bite. They wanted something where they could just make money right off the bat and, and screw the consumer is it, the way I looked at it. And I just, I just think that that's one of the big problems is, especially in the knife community, like how much can I make with the little bit of, of effort? How much can I upcharge this? There's a you lot know, of like, that with materials, I, I, I think. I mean, I know materials are expensive and they vary in cost, but yeah. sometimes it seems like the leap from one steel to another in uh, price of the final knife or the leap in having carbon fiber at questionable material at best in my opinion no i'm just kidding I'm not a huge fan but having carbon fiber on it raises the price i'm not a fan carbon fiber either i'm much more of a micarta oh yeah it, it seems more natural i'm yeah. much more of a micarta guy i'd much rather have my carta than carbon fiber uh, you know i'm friends with with big brown bear triple b handmade and he does some exotic steels and some crazy heat treats and he and i have two different perspectives on stuff like he he does these crazy outrageous steels and I'm like, yeah, but I'm coming from a perspective of these these steels that we keep going to. Uh, Maximet, this would be my my prime one. You can't sharpen Maximet in the field. You can't. You can barely sharpen Maximet at home if you've got a good set of stones, um, unless it's super, super thin like his knives are. Um, S125V, S125V, they charge a premium for it. I got I to tell you. I can I can grind one of the big stonefish in half the belts it takes me to make a small knife in S one twenty five V, and then when you look at the sharpening on that, like you got to pack a lunch. It, it's you're not doing that real fast, quick, or in a hurry. To what end? And exactly, and which is why I argue that some of the softer, lower budget steels could be a better option for a lot of people. Um, S thirty five VN. Relatively easy to sharpen, holds an edge fairly well. Spider or um, the Sabenz has been made in that for years now. I don't have a problem with that. I love one fifty four cm. One fifty four cm. I just sharpened a couple of knives in one fifty four cm, which is real close. You get the same kind of feel from that that you get from RWL thirty four, which is why I love it so much. D two so, tool steel, super super good steel for for a, for a knife. This brings me to the heat treat police, as they call them, the HRC police on YouTube. Are you, are you familiar with, you know, there, there are some guys who, um, do a lot of testing yes. of production steels. You know, you know who I'm talking yes. about. So, uh, yes. so how, where do you fall on this? I, I like to ask, especially sharpeners and steel people, <laughs> if I can call you that, uh, where do you fall on that? So for me, I actually did a live feed and I got a bunch of hate for it because it got misconstrued. I actually, a knife purchase 
the heat treat, the, the Rockwell hardness on the steel is like the last thing I look at. Absolutely last thing. I'm like, oh, okay, wait, hang on a second. What steel's it in? Like, I will go through all this stuff. Oh, I'm going to get that. Oh, wait, what steel's it in? That's an okay steel. So like, uh, 9CR8, 9CR18 MOV is a really good steel. I was like, oh, that's a crappy budget steel, this and that. And I'm like, it's 440C. I mean, it's basically a 440C analog. Um, and things like that. There's some older steels that need to come back and, and start being used so that we could have some quality. That's one of the things that American manufacturers could do. 440C is easily made in the States. It doesn't have a lot of rare earth in, minerals or, or any elements and stuff like that. Holds your edge really well and it's really rust resistant. Why aren't we making more knives in that? You know who still makes knives in that? Case knives in Bradford, Pennsylvania. And this is another thing that I say that really irritates people. 99% of the people that buy a knife, if you didn't mark the steel at all, would never know whether they got a super steel or something made out of 440C. I am so solidly in that camp, and yet still that alphanumeric combination has guided purchases. Like, mmm, that's definitely worth the money. I see M390. Funny thing, I recently put up a video of the new cold steel six-inch folding Chris. It's a beautiful, oh, you know, no, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's completely it's, useless. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's an absolute luxury item, you know, and I have a lot of yeah. those kind of luxury items. And, uh, you know, so, so I put I. it up, I put it up all proud. Look at this wavy blade and let, man, I can't believe how evenly this, they sharpen this curvy edge, you know, this and that. And someone commented, uh, and, and I'm not judging, but they were like, 440C, <laughs> you know, it was kind of like that. Right? Like, give me a break. And, and I had so many thoughts. I was like, first of all, 440C, what, what, what are you doing that 440C isn't adequate? A, uh, B, I never use this thing anyway. I, like I use 2% of my knives for anything that would like scratch the blade. So I'm not, I'm not concerned this is going to fail in my, in my next <laughs> melee. And, uh, you know, it's just such a funny comment because it just shows kind of, kind of how you can lose yourself in a hobby. And, and that's a beautiful thing. You know, they, we, yes. we are collecting luxury items. Make no mistake. You could get away with a buck 110 for the rest of your life as a folder, probably, you know, and be fine. One of my all time favorite knives. I carried one of those when I was in the military for years. But exactly. then, you know, then you, have, I have, I'm not gonna lie. I have luxury items. Like if you look oh. at this knife, I'm currently holding that's my master blaster. That is a hand carved Maker's Choice Master Blaster that my buddy Nico and Matt got for me as a gift. Uh, that's a thousand dollar knife. But I also just recently had to resharpen this because as I was cutting down boxes, I hit the concrete with it. <laughs> so I don't have, I don't have knives that sit in a safe. Uh, so all of my knives, regardless of the price, I have two Maker's Choice knives, like another thousand dollar knife sitting right here. Uh, it's another Farron Forge Maker's Choice. I carry this on a regular basis and use it. That's um, a beaut. What is that? Yeah. This is the spinner. This was the, the, uh, Gavco, Gavco uh, collab. And this is the one that is carved. It's carved like a fish. There's even scales on it. Elliot did with one thirty second ball end mill in wow. a Dremel and hand carved scales in this knife. But these knives get used. And that's where I fall in a different category than people. Like people are like, Oh, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't take anything he says to stock. He's using a thousand dollar knife to open boxes. I'm like, what am I going to do with it if I don't open boxes and stuff with it? If I don't use it, then then it's worthless to me. I had a box sitting here in a room with me, like ten thousand dollars from knives in it. I use every one of them. Yeah, it's a funny it's a funny question because you know you thousand dollars of anything you want to put it in a frame and hang it on the wall or put it in a safe, but but this is uh, the first tool we ever came up with, so so let's and use it. <laughs> the flip side of it too is I know how to anodize, I know how to refinish, I know how to do ceramic coatings and bead blast and tumble and all those things. I now know how to do. So even if I use one of those knives and I happen to scrape it up and, and, and mar the finish, then I still, I am still able to bring it right back to brand new. I've re-anodized my, I've re-anodized my, uh, my Farron Forge Entac probably 12 times. It's the most carried knife in my case. Let's talk about your new knife coming out. Oh, the Sea Snake. Yes. The Sea Snake. The one through uh, Artisan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you what my impression of it is. It's, it's a beautiful, uh, sort of, uh, smallish, uh, worn cliff that just looks like you could stash it on your person. Uh, but it also looks big enough to do work. It looks like it's about a four and a half inch blade, maybe. It's about 
three, I think it's three and a half. It's a little over three and a half inch oh. blade. And, and it's, it's coming it's out really from artist. Very long blade. It's about. It's just about three, three and a half inches. Uh, but which is a good size. What I wanted was I always, you know, everybody talks about an EDC fixed blade, and a lot of times it's really they're not that. When you start getting into an EDC fixed blade, they're usually really thick, like neck knives. So it tends to be really thick. And I didn't want that. I wanted just a fixed blade knife. I just wanted one that was in a small package that was easy to carry and. Um, that's actually the second design of that knife. The original one was a drop point. And my friends, Matt and Nico, were like, oh, that'd be really good if it was a, if it was a warning. And I was like, so I took the one I'd done for my daughter and I just laid it down and I drew it. And then I just flipped the blade over and lined everything up and just <laughs> basically ground the handle the right way and then the blade in reverse. And uh, it, it, came out, it came out so great. Uh, I actually made way less stonefish than i did what was originally called the scorpion or i mean uh i made way less of the original scorpion which was the drop point version that i did the sea snake and so uh just had it on me at the usn show in vegas and i showed it to tim reeve uh i love tim tim and i will <laughs> tim, tim and i'll spend an entire show and just not me him and aaron frederick we would just sit in a corner and not go watch the rest of the show and just sit there and drink beer and just bs <laughs> and never wants to talk about anything but knives and and things that we've done and, and sea stories. But so Tim, uh, Tim grabbed me. He's like, "Hey man, I took some of the guys over and I showed him the uh, the stonefish." He's like, "I really love that knife." He's like, "I, I, I want to see your uh, your logo, but like engraved in something as opposed to laser etched." And we got into that, and he goes, "Oh, what's up? What's up? I, I saw you had like a small small fixed blade." And I pulled out, I had borrowed my friend Matt's sea snake that I'd made for him. Just, just to have one because I hadn't gotten to carry any. I don't own any of my own knives because <laughs> I have to. I have to sell them all, and so I just wanted to carry it. And I just happened to have it on me in Vegas. And I was like, "Oh, like this?" And he's like, "Yeah, that is great. A small little EDC fixed blade." And so we were walking by, and I was talking with with him, and we stopped by the artisan table, and I showed it to the owner of Artisan Knives, and they jumped on it. They were like, "Yeah, we'll make that." Right. And so uh -huh. here we are from USN, which was about August last year, I think. Till now, the knife is, I've got production, I've got production samples coming. It's in a proprietary steel, mm. which I can't really let you guys know what the prep, what the components are, but I will tell you it's very similar to a steel that Spyderco used to use that I liked a lot. And it, it's going to be something that, it's going to be something that's affordable and things like that, but it's, it is that. It's a very small, easy to carry, fixed blade and they're they're sending it out as a necker as a neck knife with uh with a chain but it's also got holes you can set that up for soft loop and wear it as a belt knife and so i think it's going to be i think it's going to be really really something good that a lot of people are gonna are, are gonna jump on and the nice thing is it's going to be affordable like that's the only problem i had with the stonefish mm -hmm. i love the guys that we I tried to get them to a lower price point, but they were like, look, we, we've got to make the money on this for the production cost. And so it wound up being a $300 knife almost. And I was like, I don't think like people like fixed blades. They're like, oh, I don't know if we can sell a fixed blade. They're like, well, we didn't sell that many. I was like, it's because no one wants a $300 fixed blade. Yeah. A Especially a production, a production, uh, a yeah. $300 fixed blade. So how do you carry, how do you carry the scorpion? Wait, what'd you call it? What's the, okay, the sea snake? The how do you snake. Yep. So the sea snake is, I carry it soft loop, uh, okay. field, uh, I'm sorry, scout style, right in the okay. small of my back. Or you can carry it on your left side for a cross draw. It, it's, it's small enough. Like seriously, Bobby, I can put it in the palm of my hand. And, you know, I've got big hands. I can pretty much cover the entire knife with my hand. But you've got enough blade and it's a Warren Cliff style blade, which gives you a, a, a continuous cutting surface. I mean, you could actually use it as a self-defense tool if you needed to. But, um, like I said, my buddy Matt has one of the ones I made in S125V and he's, he loves it. It's great. He cuts down, I've only ever had to sharpen it once and he cuts down cardboard all the time with it. And so it's just, it's like having a little box cutter, fixed blade, uh, style EDC knife in a smaller package. And it's going to be fairly lightweight. They're going to be like, they're going to be under a hundred dollars. Nice. Do you know when we can expect them? Um, I have, I've got the prototypes coming in for me to review. And if I don't see any issues with them, I'm going to give them the go ahead to just start rolling them off the line. 
So I'm hoping in the next few months, we'll start seeing them on Amazon and maybe some other vendors. Um, one of the, one of the issues I see is some of the big knife vendors don't like to take things in stock if they're available on Amazon. It's almost like, oh, you went to Amazon, we we won't carry it. It's a little um, bit of snobbery there. Well, which I think it's kind of silly. Yeah, definitely. Let us know when those uh, are ready to go. I know uh, people will want to jump on them. I know I certainly will. I I am a fan of EDCing fixed blades. I go through it seasonally. I, I find obviously I do it much more in the winter time. Uh, when I have more, yeah, you know, clothes to kind of cover things up with. Uh, but this knife, the, the sea snake looks and sounds like one that you could also drop in your pocket. And I'm a big fan of that. Uh, taking a neck knife and, and just dropping it in the pocket and put yeah, maybe yeah. some cord on it and you can just, you know, I've, all, all uh, sorts of ways to carry a fixed blade. I actually had thought about making a leather pocket slip for mm-hmm. one of the prototypes when they get here and doing it that way. Like you said, um, I also have, if you've ever seen them, my little Viper neck knives, they look like a Kiridashi. I've got a few people that have said, oh, I don't need a sheath. I'm going to make a pocket slip for a little leather pocket slip and, and carry it pocket like that. And I'm like, oh, that's actually a really good idea. Um, so, Mike, tell people where they can catch up with you. They can I, find out information yes. about you and, and how to follow you and such. Well, you can find you can find an entire section of people that just can't stand me on Reddit. Uh, that'd be <laughs> one way. Um, I'm basically, I'm on YouTube. I try to do two videos a week on YouTube. Um, there had been a little slack off of that when I first started doing construction because the business really wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't paying the bills. And I said, well, we've reached the point where I've diminished our savings to where I have to take a a grown up job. (laughs) Um, but yeah, you can find me if you just search, if you search Mike Emler on YouTube, you're right there. And then if you, if you try to find me on Instagram, you might be able to find me by by name but the the thing is like everybody says i'm full of it but there is a shadow ban and you have to type it in my entire instagram handle which is the emler edge underscore crazy sharp llc you do not i'm here to tell you i looked oh, you up on is instagram it and i did not i just yeah i just put your name in okay and well I've, then then that's then i apparently have not been as naughty on instagram as <laughs> as facebook you do have a lot of uh funny funny uh uploads on on Instagram, can people just, uh, are, are you, I know you do this for Fair and Forge and I know you have your own knife business, but can people send you knives to sharpen? Is this, well, that is, that is the primary business. The knife making is more of a hobby that kind of pays for itself. I, I've told people like, oh, you're like one of the, you're a great knife maker. I, was, I am not by any stretch a knife maker. I've designed a couple mm-hmm. knives that came out and were great for me. I basically made knives for me and other people like them. So I'm not, I don't consider myself a knife maker, maybe a knife designer a little, uh, but most of it is just the sharpening. And so, uh, I have, you know, I do everything via, via email. Um, and I, I have a, I have a, a set price structure video that I send to all customers that they email me. Uh, but mainly in my videos, in every one of my videos in the intro, there's a picture of my business card. Um, at the end of the actual intro, and the best way to get a hold of me is via email. I, I, d- I don't usually take phone calls throughout the day. Uh, you know this. <laughs> if I don't recognize a number, I'm probably not going to answer it. Uh, but if if somebody does happen to text me, I usually tell them like, "Hey, it's great. Just send me an email so we can we can do this." Because if if you're in my text stream, you're going to get lost. I get so many texts. So I have an email they can just basically get a hold of me at uh, gunmonkey1974 at gmail.com. That's basically where all of my business email goes. That's what's on the business card. And so, yeah, the, the YouTube channel is usually what generates the majority of the, the stuff. And people ask the same question all the time. I was like, oh, do you take on sharpening? And I was like, if you read the description, there's the thing that says right there for email, for, for sharpening or refinishing services, email, it's in the description of, of every one of my videos. It's an auto populating thing. Right, right. Well, I think I'm going to send you a couple of your least favorite knives to get the Emler edge on. Uh, no, I, I'll send you some. I, I do love a convex edge, and I, I would love to have a knife sharpened on on genuine Japanese stones by uh, you know someone as yeah. expert as you. So uh, I don't have too many of the natural stones anymore. They uh, they're expensive, and they they have a tendency to come apart. They like to stay mm-hmm. wet, wet all the time, and just so I've went with some of the synthetic water stones and i use the diamond matrix stones that that david scott makes for the edge pro 
And I use uh, aluminum oxide. Some steels just do better on that. Uh, if there's not a lot of vanadium in them, you can do them real easily on aluminum oxide stones and get nice crispy edge. And it's not that expensive for me to replace stones. Nice. So, well, Mike Emler, I want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure to finally talk with you and, and catch up with you. Fun. This yeah. has been fun. This has been fun. And uh, I would love it if you got back in touch. Let us know when uh, uh, when the sea snake is going to be, you know, when it's good to go, when people can can buy it. Also, oh, yeah, absolutely. Also, uh, sometime in the future, I'd love to do a show on sharpening. We do Thursday night knives. It'd be great to have you on live. Maybe we can do a little symposium on sharpening sometime. But in any case, Mike, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on the show. No problem. Subscribe to the Knife Junkies YouTube channel at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. All right, back on episode number 124 of the Knife Junkie podcast. And Bob, uh, probably an interview that uh, kind of hit home or hit, hit close to home for you as you have uh, some knife sharpening uh, equipment, yeah. at least, and have done some knife <laughs> sharpening, that kind of thing. Yeah, I bought the equipment. No, I, <laughs> I, I, you know, I like to keep my knife sharp. I, I certainly uh, am not to the point where I'm uh, sharpening other people's knives, except as favors. Uh, if right. you know, but two things really jumped out at me. One on a very personal level, he kept mentioning sacrifice, and uh, that's uh, a concept I've been thinking about a lot recently. The idea of uh, giving something up in the present for a better future, and uh, you know, it, that's part of what being human is—a very unique part. Uh, another thing is the visual of him sharpening, kind of just standing there in the zone, you know, right. with, the, with the stone in his hand and the knife just going back and forth. And just, you know, when you sharpen knives long enough, even if you're an amateur like myself, you get the feel of when you're doing it right. You can tell when when everything, you know, when the angle is just right and you're contacting the surface, uh, the strop or the stone with the edge just right. And I just kind of can see him standing there rocking back on his heels, mm -hmm. uh, you know, zoning out doing that. I think All right. Cool. Be uh, nice if you could uh, do that thing, do that as you're watching a movie or chilling out or, you know, on the couch with family. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I guess he, he can, uh, but I would probably slice half my right. head off doing that. <laughs> Cut the couch in half or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've never done that. All right. Well, pretty cool uh, interview. Again, as we said, you can uh, find uh, Mike Emler on YouTube. I think it's uh, Crazy Sharp is the uh, the name of his YouTube channel. And again, the uh, Knife Junkies YouTube channel is at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Bob, uh, as we're wrapping up our Sunday interview show, uh, one quick note about uh, ways for knife newbies and knife junkies to get involved with the Knife Junkie podcast, YouTube channel, that kind of thing. Become a patron. Join the mm -hmm. Knife Junkies Patreon. Yeah, we've had uh, a few patrons join uh, just recently because I just uh, set up a page. And I'm very excited we're going to be mentioning their name on the supplemental episode. Uh, and uh, in any case, it's it's uh, it's an honor to know that someone would part with uh, a little bit of money every month uh, in exchange for what we do. Right. And part of the uh, Knife Junkies Patreon is uh, for you to have a chance to win a knife every month. That's at the $10 level. So I want to uh, go ahead and let you know that if you want to get in on that opportunity to win a knife every month, go ahead and uh, join the Knife Junkies Patreon at uh, theknifejunkie.com slash Patreon, theknifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The first monthly knife drawing will be on Thursday, July 16th during our Thursday Night Knives show. So uh, Thursday, July 16th, first knife giveaway only for $10 members of the Knife Junkies Patreon. All right, Bob, final thought, final word as we wrap it up. Don't take dull for an answer. All right, folks, there you heard it. I love that one. Don't take dull for an answer. All right, for Mr. DeMarco, the Knife Junkie, I'm Jim Person, the Knife Newbie, saying thanks for joining us here on episode number 124 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear 
hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. 